it is a few moments before we are to begin our midweek Bible study, and I invite you at this time to get ready to join with us, if you would, and uh, we're going to have a good time in the Word of God tonight. We start at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time, so that is, whoops, this is supposed to be muted. There we go. There we go. All right, so uh, uh, we start at 7 o'clock, so it's just about two minutes. So we're going to give folks a chance to get here and, and join us. And then we'll be beginning in just a moment. <clears throat> I blink a lot during, because that light is so bright, you know. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes the tents make me blink. Reminds me of trying to do uh, stand, up. stand up in New York City. Boy, I'm telling you. Those lights that are coming at you are so blinding that, you know, you're standing up there, you can't see the audience for all the glare in your face. Mm -hmm. Got about another minute, folks, before we begin, but we invite you to join us. Can you use your fingers on my screen? See if you can pull in a little bit tighter on the uh, tablet. No. Okay, maybe that uh, tablet you can't. All right, let's do a sound test. Here we go. Sound test one, two, three. Sound test one, two, three. I realize that you might say, well, I heard you pretty good without the microphone. Um, and that's all well and good, but I want to make certain, absolutely certain, that throughout the entire uh, Bible study, everything we say can be heard and understood clearly. I want to make certain there's absolutely no issue with the sound, okay? So that's why we're using amplification. Okay, according to my laptop, it is now 7 o'clock p.m. here in the great state of Alabama, and that means it is time for our midweek Bible study. We have been engaged now for several weeks uh, in the beginning of our um, extensive look at what the Word of God has to say about the gifts of the Spirit. We are a Spirit-filled church. Uh, many people would understand that to be a Pentecostal church. Uh, we're, we don't shy away from the word Pentecostal. I love the Pentecostal message. I've been uh, in this thing since I was a kid, have the Holy Ghost since I was five. And so uh, I don't shy away from that word. I realize for a lot of people, especially in the LGBT community, there's been a lot of abuse and a lot of mistreatment, and therefore people tend to kind of shy away from some of these things. But as I always say, don't throw the baby away with the bath water. Amen. Um, but we are a spirit-filled church. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We are a church that operates in the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, that is not something we shy away from. In today's world, in the church today, um, you don't see the gifts of the Spirit very often in operation. 
and it's pitiful. It's sad, it is shameful, uh, but when your message gets so far out of whack, when you become so entangled in politics and the affairs of this world, uh, which the Word of God cautions us not to become involved in, the Apostle Paul said, no man of war entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. And, uh, you know, you've got to know your priorities. And the church has a priority, and that is to demonstrate the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God in the world, and to evangelize, to reach out to the lost. That's, that's all we're called to do. That's it. And if the whole world goes to hell around us, so be it that we are not here, n never are we called to affect the world. We're not here to change the world. That is not the purpose of the church. That is what Jesus Christ will do after he has returned, not the rapture, but after he has physically returned, uh, the, what is referred to as the second coming. At that time, he will establish his kingdom in the earth, the new Jerusalem, who glory, will descend from heaven and will rest uh, upon the earth and it will become the uh, capital, as it were, of the world and uh, Christ will reign eternal and supreme. And uh, then he's going to make everything what it ought to be. People who want to believe today that the church is supposed to engage in activities to change the world and make the world into their image of righteousness and godliness, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to believe me. This old prophetic preacher, you can look at me and think I'm the biggest fat jackass on the planet. I don't care. I'm telling you today, thus saith the Lord, people who have bought into that lie, first of all, they're falling right into the same identical trap that the Roman church has operated in for centuries. Number one, you're, you're falling right into the same identical mindset of the mother of harlots, and you're looking just like her. Well, guess what that makes you? <laughs> makes you a daughter of the harlot. And uh, there are Protestant churches, non-Catholic churches, today, especially in the evangelical and fundamentalist communities, that every single day are looking more and more like Mother Rome. And they are going to bed with politicians, they are committing fornication, spiritual fornication, with uh, worldly leaders and politicians in an effort to uh, mandate and legislate what they perceive as uh, morality and godliness and all this foolishness. And um, uh, so they're looking more and more like mama. So we're starting to see when the word of God says in the book of Revelation that the great whore Revelation has daughters and she's the mother of harlots, we're beginning to see who her children are. These uh, organizations, these denominations have come out of Catholicism, and yet they are very much uh, resembling her and following in her footsteps. And that is not the mission of the church. Those, listen to me, because this is what I was starting to say a minute ago, those who are falling into that mindset are prime targets for the spirit of Antichrist because the Antichrist is going to appear as a Messiah who is going to change the world and make everything what it ought to be and all these idiot Christians 
who think that that's what the church is supposed to do, every one of you all are going to wind up being uh, perfect targets for the entry. You're not going to you're not going to fall under his uh, persecution because you're going to go to bed with him. Look how quickly you fell into bed with Donald Trump when he said, vote for me and I'll make sure all the things you want uh, happen. I'll make sure, I'll stack the courts so that you get what you want politically. And how quickly you were willing to go to bed with a whoremonger and a liar and a deceiver. How quickly you were willing to overlook all of his evils and his wickedness because you would get out of him what you wanted politically. Honey, got news for you. The Antichrist is going to be in the same exact vein. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Donald Trump, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to go there today, but I have to. I feel like I need to. Donald Trump, I was telling that couple we met Sunday, said he was a test for the evangelical church in America, the white evangelical church in America. He was a test. He was the precursor. I do not believe he's the Antichrist by any means, but I believe he is the precursor to the Antichrist, I told you. I prophesied, good Lord, it's actually been a couple of years ago that the Lord said, I'm going to shake the tree. And every fruit that is not firmly, you know, holding on to the vine is going to shake loose. Well, guess what? That's what he's done. He's shaken the tree. And all the people who are not spiritual, but who are carnal and worldly in their thinking, have fallen into the cult Trump, uh, the Trump cult, and uh, they're believing all the deceptions, they're believing the lies, they're compromising themselves spiritually for the sake of political influence and, and influence in the world. And folks, this ministry is about, and we will remain about, preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We are here to lead the lost to Christ. We are here to bring those who are backslidden, those who are astray, uh, back into the fold of safety. We are here to strengthen believers. Uh, we are here to inspire faith, to encourage. That is the mission of God's church. The Word of God says, and how people can work to change what the Word of God says. It amazes me how people in the church are so foolish. Scripture clearly says, in the last days, evil men shall wax worse and worse. Clearly says that. So when things around you are getting what you perceive as more and more evil, why should that surprise you? The scripture said that's going to happen. And then they're like, oh, but you know, America's a special nation. We're this anointed nation. You're full of crap. That is garbage. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Again, this is all the enemy deceiving Christians in America. That whole divine destiny bull has been going on now since the birth of our nation. This isn't new. This has been going on pretty much since the birth of our nation. The Word of God states clearly, 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 clearly that there is one nation on the earth. One nation on the entire planet that operates in covenant with God. One. And it's not America, honey. It's Israel. Okay. America is not in the Bible. America is not, you know, this great nation. You know, all this baloney has been blown up and created so the enemy could distract the church. America should be, as it has been for centuries, 
it should be the uh, launch pad for all kinds of missionaries and evangelistic efforts. For many years, that's what it was. You know, America was probably the greatest uh, point of origin for evangelistic efforts. And of course, the same time, because of our freedoms, uh, freedom of religion and all this, we've also been the springboard for the majority of the world's biggest cults. Mormonism, come out of America. Jehovah's Witnesses, come out of America. Christian science comes out of America. All of these false doctrines and false faiths come out of America uh, because of these freedoms that we have in terms of religion, which I agree with. I'm not saying we shouldn't have freedom of religion. But, folks, if you're going to embrace the principles of our founding father, then our founding fathers, I should say, then you have to anticipate that you're going to have to take the good with the bad. That is just the nature of liberty. That is the nature of freedom. If you want to be free to worship God and to go to church when you want to go and worship the Lord however you want to worship Him, then the woman who wants to get an abortion should be legal. It should be her right to get an abortion, period. End of the story. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, makes no difference in the world. If we are going to be a free nation, if we're genuinely going to embrace so-called freedom and liberty and justice for all, then it has to be for all. The minute we allow government to step into the private personal decisions of anyone Republicans love to use the slippery slope argument. If I hear that one, I swear to God, I'm going to smack the next Republican I meet that comes out with that garbage. Slippery slope, slippery slope, you know, wham. Idiots. They preach it constantly, but they never, ever, 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 ever see it in their own ideologies and in their own actions and in the things they're trying to do. The minute you tell a woman that a decision that is so personal and so private as to what she does with her own body because your religious convictions are such that life begins at conception, which, by the way, prior to 1980, the Fundamentalist Church and the Evangelical Church in America did not embrace that position. But the minute you start telling a woman what she can do in private and in, in a decision of concerning her own body, you talk about a slippery slope, honey. But for too long, you're going to be telling people what they can and cannot do in their bedrooms. Um, if, you want, if you want to start letting religious folks dictate what the law ought to be, well, I can't wait until we finally get somebody in office who believes the Bible, and instead of preaching the jackass and I Republican baloney of marriages between one man and one woman. Yeah, but there's a little phrase you're failing to include in that definition of marriage. For life. Biblical marriage between a man and a woman, my friend, is not until you decide to divorce and marry somebody else. No, 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 no. Jesus said the scripture they love to use to try to come against gay marriage. Jesus said from the beginning it was not so, you know. And, but that very passage is Jesus talking about divorce and remarriage. He's not talking about gay marriage or anything else. He's talking about divorce and remarriage. And yet, they want to tell us that marriage has always been between one man and one woman. Baloney. Baloney. Marriage has always been a contract between two people for 
life, period. And according to the Apostle Paul, as long as your spouse, even if you've divorced them, as long as they're still living, you are not free to remarry because if you do, you're committing adultery. That is the teaching of Scripture. Now, what happens if we get a biblical purist in office? What if folks in America who are so religious and so full of faith, hallelujah, glory to God, finally get the dictator they want, and that dictator decides that we're going to really do things biblically, hallelujah, glory to God. You only get one turn it back. When you get married, that's the only marriage you can have until the person you married has died. What if all of a sudden somebody tried, and there are people watching and they're saying literally, and they're saying, well, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, all the slippery slope arguments used against liberals and used against Democrats are legitimate, and, and all those arguments, you know, are, are uh, reasonable arguments. But what I'm saying is ridiculous. No, it's not, folks. You better be careful. The minute you start taking any freedoms away from anybody for any reason, you are putting all of us at risk of freedoms being taken away. And uh, we need to be very careful. Now, I say all that. I'm not here. To, I'm not trying to give a political speech. What I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to get at is we can either be a church that looks at things spiritually, does things spiritually, operates spiritually. That includes operating in the power of God and in and uh, with the gifts of the Spirit in operation, or we can be a carnal church that's busy trying to do political things and fighting social battles and all this foolishness, but you cannot do both. No man of war entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. The minute a soldier gets all caught up and what's going on at home, and what's happening, you know, at home with his family or in his community or whatever the case might be, what's going to happen to that soldier? He's going to get killed because he's distracted. He's not paying attention. He is not focused on his mission. That is what Satan has done to the church. He has distracted the church. He has caused them to lose focus. They are no longer focused on their true biblical mission. They are no longer focused on the Great Commission. They are focused on things uh, in, in, in the political realm, in the social realm, in the societal realm, you know. And uh, they have, they're going to be destroyed. It is going to destroy them. And uh, so say, Pastor, why are you teaching on the gifts of the Spirit? Because the gifts of the Spirit are how God writes the ship. Jesus Christ is the head of the church, folks. Nowhere in the Word of God does the Lord ever abdicate his authority to some governing body. No. No. Even the apostles who had a unique anointing and a unique calling, they were given the responsibility of establishing the foundation of the church. The church is built upon, according to the writings of the Apostle Paul, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Okay. Even the apostles fully understood that Christ was the head at all times. And 
no governing body has ever been appointed or anointed or called since the apostles. There's no such thing as some divinely anointed body that represents Christ in the earth. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is God Almighty, and by his spirit, he has been in the earth since the day of Pentecost. And by his spirit, he manifests himself through the gifts of the spirit. And it is through the gifts of the spirit that he communicates with the church. He writes the, uh, the ship. He sets our course. There are times when through the gifts of the spirit, whether it be uh, through prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, whatever the case might be, there are times when the Lord has to rebuke the church and say, you're going the wrong way. You're looking the wrong direction. Uh, and there are times when he encourages the, is the church and says, hang in there, folks. You know, you're doing the right thing. Just keep going. I have seen prophetically, uh, I've seen the Lord operate in prophecy in both ways. You know, I've seen him literally uh, speak to various congregations and to the church and say, you know, hey, you're way off track. You're way off base. And then at the same time, I've seen him at other times say, I see your struggle. I know the hardship you're going through, but hang in there because thus and so. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? So the gifts of the Spirit are integral, integral to a church that is trying to do things God's way. If you're not interested in doing things God's way, if you're Rod Parsley, if you're... Uh, uh, John Hagee and all these political and uh, you know if, if you're these kind of characters honey the gifts of the spirit don't mean anything to you matter of fact if anything you'd rather that they remain muted because otherwise you might hear from God and you're not going to like what you have to hear I've been trying to warn since I was a kid since I was 12 years old the Lord used to use me in the church I grew up in. I didn't even really, actually before 12, now that I think about it, but anyway, um, the Lord used to use me. There were times that I got up in our church and I would begin to testify, you know, and I was just talking about how good the Lord had been to me and what the Lord had done for me and all. And then all of a sudden, a prophetic anointing would come over me and I'd begin to admonish the church folks, we better be careful because if we're not careful, we are going to lose the move of God. We are going to lose um, the operation of the spirit that we have in this church. And I kept warning. I warned. There were times I was in absolute tears warning. And the church I grew up in ignored every warning. And as the years went by, they drifted further and further away. And there were specific instances like the election of a specific man to pastor the church and a woman in the church was frankly deceitful to be frank and she was manipulative in her efforts to try to get a guy voted in who had graduated from her alma mater and that was the only reason she wanted him there was he the man for the hour not by a million miles. And I prophesied, this man is going to destroy this church. He's going to ruin this church. And he did. So the gifts of the Spirit are important. But like I've said in the past, the gifts of the Spirit are only as good as the people listen carefully, who recognize them when they're in operation. If you don't recognize 
a prophetic word, when you hear a prophetic word, then what good was that prophetic word? Didn't mean nothing. If you don't recognize the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Jesus Christ is speaking when there is a word that comes through tongues with interpretation, then what good is it? It means nothing. If you don't appreciate and value it for what it is, then it's worthless to you. And unfortunately, because the gifts of the Spirit are so much uh, lacking in the church world today, most people who call themselves believers wouldn't recognize the gifts if they came down and knocked him in the head. And this is why things are in such disarray. This is why the church is in the condition it's in today, because people don't value, they don't understand, they don't appreciate, they don't recognize, say, all right, Pastor, well, what's the cure? Because I'm not the kind of preacher that likes to talk about always, you know, the problem. I'm, I tell Tommy all the time, he'll always say, well, here's the problem, here's what's wrong, here's the problem. And I'll say, okay, fine, well, and then I'll think about it and all, and I'll say, well, here's what we ought to do, here's what we can do. And I'll tell him, I say, you know, you're all worried about the problem, I'm worried about the solution. So, I'm, God didn't call me to articulate the problem. The Lord called me to articulate the solution. The solution is simple. Every sincere believer ought to be prayerful. And, and I mean, folks, when I say sincere believer, I mean sincere believer because there's a lot of people out there who call themselves sincere, when in reality, they're not. They're not. Uh -uh. They'll stand there, they'll say the words. But you got to remember, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Just because you put on an act and you act like you're, oh, I'm a sincere Christian. I want to hear from the Lord. I want the Lord to show me what's true and what isn't. Just because you say those words, honey, doesn't mean that you mean what you're saying. And if you think saying the words is somehow going to get God to force you to see stuff you don't want to see, it's not going to happen. I told you before, one of the most important things to learn about the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, is God is always, for lack of a better analogy, a perfect gentleman. God never forces anything on anyone. Okay? When you see somebody shouting in church, when you see somebody dancing in church, that's not because God, you know, took them over and forced them to do this. No, 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 no. No, God, God's not going to embarrass you. God's not going to humiliate you. God is not you know, that's not how the Spirit of the Lord operates. Like Mount Dorothy used to say, before she became a Christian, she used to go up home. She lived in Texas, and she'd go up to Connecticut during the summer months because Texas is hot. And she never liked me. She never adapted to Texas heat. In all the years she lived there, I never did either. And, I, and of course, Alabama's not a whole lot better, uh, if, if not at all. And... Uh, but Aunt Dorothy would go up to Connecticut during the summer months. She worked at a school, so she got the summers off. She'd go up home for like July, August, and uh, June, July, and August, kind of, you know. And because uh, here in Texas, they, they let out of school the end of May and all that. Well, anyway, and she used to say, you know, she'd go up home and my grandparents, my mother's parents, they used to have what they call family altar at the house. And they had 10 children. And they, my grandma and grandpa would sit with the kids and they'd read from the word of God and they'd pray. And my Aunt Dorothy said, 
Uh, Laurel, at the time, was just a kid. She said, Laurel was just a kid. Said she's probably 10 or 12 years old. And she said, and I'd watch her, she'd be praying. And all of a sudden, she'd get to praying in the Spirit. She'd be praying, talking in tongues, praying in the Spirit. And I'll go to sometimes she'd be saying it in the Spirit. And Aunt Dorothy was kind of amazed by it, and she asked my grandmother about it because she didn't understand it, you know. She said, you know, uh, does she know what she's doing? Does she, you know, and she'd ask her all these questions. My grandmother tried to explain to her. And um, so Aunt Dorothy go to church every once in a while when my grandma, well, back then our little church was quite a, and Brother Tatlock's church, you know, was a marvelous boy. I mean, folks, those ladies that shout their hair down and dance and run the aisles and get happy. And I mean, they had church. And Dorothy go and she said, these people out of their mind crazy. So one time she got spooked. <laughs> all these people getting happy and all that. Dorothy said, I just wanted to get out of the building. She still smoked back then, you know, she wasn't in church or anything. And she said, I was going to go outside and have me a cigarette, she said. And don't you know, as I was, walk, as I was trying to scoot out from the pew and, and sneak out, she said, I tripped over somebody's foot and fell right down on my face. She said, this lady leaned over and said, don't worry, honey. It's just the Holy Ghost. Mm. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyway, <laughs> but Aunt Dorothy said, you know, she said, back then, she said, I always said, bless God, I would never want to be, I'd never in the world I'd be one of these kind of people. I'd never be that. You know, she grew up Catholic like my grandmother did, and uh, my great grandmother, and she said, I, I'd never do this kind of thing. I'd never be like this. Well, got news for you. Tommy knows she became one of the worst offenders. <laughs> she became one of the biggest dancers and shouters and hollers in the church. And uh, uh, but it was not forced upon her. You know, the Lord doesn't force anything upon anybody. Uh, that's why even in Pentecostal churches, uh, some people are quiet. You know, some people are quiet. They're they're. They're timid people. They're quiet people, you know. And um, my brother Dallas used to hang out with a family at a church, a apostolic church we were part of in East Texas. And uh, when he lived with me, and uh, the mother of that family, a real precious lady, I, I love her to death. And uh, she was just a real, real quiet woman, you know, real kind of mousy and just real timid, you know. And in church, we'd have shout meetings. Boy, I mean, the Holy Ghost get to moving, and you'd really feel the Lord in a wonderful way. And she'd just kind of be there nice and quiet like, you know. And one day, Dallas said to me, he said, you know how quiet Sister Washington is in church and everything? I said, yeah. He said, boy, howdy. You ought to hear her at home. He said, us kids will be outside playing, and she'll say, well, I'm going to go in my room and pray for a while, you know. And he said, and she'll be in her room. He said, all of a sudden, you hear her shouting and <laughs> having a time. See, because she was more comfortable when she was alone, letting go and letting God. The Lord didn't force anything on anybody. Well, having said that, the answer to the dilemma in the church today is every sincere, truthfully sincere believer should pray and ask God, Lord, make me sensitive to the gifts of the Spirit. Make, help me to recognize when the gifts are in operation. Help me to recognize when a prophecy is spoken to recognize it as prophecy. There are times that a prophecy will be spoken just like I'm sitting here in this seat talking to you right now, and yet God has actually put a prophetic word in me, and I'm speaking a prophetic word. So in other words, you don't have to be in church and have you know some big manifestation for a prophetic word to be uttered. And those of us who are sensitive to the gifts of the Spirit, 
a lot of times we will recognize, even sitting here, like after the Bible study, somebody might say to me, Brother, you are prophesying tonight. You're aware you are prophesying tonight. You know what I'm saying? Because literally, because they discerned, they were able to tell, they were able to sense that there was more going on than me just sharing something out of my own head or out of my own heart. No, the Spirit of the Lord had placed this in me to share, and that's why I was sharing it. And I've got news for you. Uh, I believe with all my heart that every word I've said up until right now has been under a prophetic anointing because I didn't have any intention of saying one word of that, and yet somehow there was there was this uh, ur this um, urgency and this pressure in me in my spirit to speak and to talk about some of these things, you know. Uh, I didn't have this on, on the plate for this evening. Anyway, let's begin right now with a word of prayer. And then we're, I don't think tonight's topic should go extremely long. But every time I say that, we wind up going the full length anyway. But uh, we'll see. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master, Savior, Redeemer, King, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for every opportunity that we have how can we as a free people living in a nation that allows us to worship freely how can we not appreciate every opportunity that we have to come together to explore the word of god to experience your presence and the fellowship and the communion of the holy ghost how can we not be grateful for this? There are people all over the world, their lives are at stake when they try to get together with other believers. Their lives are at stake when they try to break open the Word of God and study and pray in the company of other believers. But we're grateful, Lord, today for this opportunity I pray, Master, in the name of Jesus, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's not just necessary when we preach, it's necessary when we teach, it is necessary whenever the Word of God is spoken, even when we share one-on-one -on -one or we testify or when we um, witness to someone, we need the anointing, Master. Lord, tonight I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would be loose this evening. Help me to uh, expound upon these final gifts in this, uh, our, our initial portion of this Bible study. Help me, Lord, to speak that which I need to speak, to remain silent where I ought to remain silent, that the people of God might be blessed, encouraged, and edified. Master, grant it tonight, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. We have discussed the first seven gifts of the Spirit um, up until today. We've discussed the, uh, the word of wisdom. We have discussed the word of knowledge. We have discussed the... Um, supernatural faith you know meaning uh, uh, where god literally endows us with faith um we have discussed uh, the gifts of healing we've discussed the working of miracles we've discussed prophecy and discerning of spirits now the last two gifts kind of uh, are in a similar vein they're they're both in the same category we have Di di diverse or diversity of tongues and interpretation of tongues. When you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, there is the initial physical evidence. God purposely designed the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Ghost to come with evidence. 
Human beings are fickle. We want to see. We want to see. I have to laugh. Uh, I've studied over the course of the last many years. I've just I've studied a number of cults in my life. Okay, I've studied all about the Mormons. I probably know more about Mormonism than most Mormons know. I've just I've studied Jehovah's Witnessism and you know all. Uh, uh, these different cults, you know, Christian science and what have you. And uh, what makes me laugh, for instance, about the JWs, they claim to have, they, 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 lucky for them, they have dual class membership in the JW. The, every member is not on the same level. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you have the anointed class. And then you got the rest of the jackass peons. <laughs> Which is garbage because according to the word of God, all believers are on the same identical level. That includes ministers and uh, saints. Okay, you have different responsibilities. You may have different authority, but you're not a different class of Christian or a different class of believer. But in the JW, no, they have the anointed class. And how do you know somebody is part of the anointed class? They break out talking in tongues, and that's evidence that they're part, that something supernatural transpires that helps you to know they're part. No, they tell you. Well, I believe that I'm, I'm of the anointed. I believe that I'm of the anointed, and they declare themselves, I'm of the anointed class. Really? Oh, well, isn't that just great? So you're better than everybody else. You're going to sit in heaven and help Jesus rule the world while the rest of everybody else is confined to planet Earth. And how do we know you're in that special class? Because you said so. You told us. Well, you say, well, but Pastor, you know, you say that God called you to preach. Yeah. And... When you, when we Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled people say that we have a call to preach, let me tell you what else we believe. We believe there's evidence of that calling. There's a lot of people who call themselves called to preach, and I see no evidence of a call on their life. When there's a call, you know there's a call. Uh, I was in a grocery store years ago, and a lady come over to me, and she said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, well, yes, ma'am, I am. I was all, at the time, I was maybe 17, 18 years old, right? And she said, I could tell. She said, I could just feel it. I just knew it. My cousin Janelle and I were standing outside of 7-Eleven one day, and a man walked up to us, and, and he says, You're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, Yes, I am. And he said, I need you to pray for me. And, you know, when God has placed a call on your life, then that call is evidence. There's, there's a testimony from the Spirit of God that you have a call on your life. And... Uh, yeah, people can claim to be called who are not called. But anybody who's the least bit spiritual can easily tell when somebody's calling themselves called but is not versus when someone genuinely has a call on their life. But when it comes to the born again experience, God designed the baptism, the infilling of the Holy Ghost to be accompanied by physical evidence for a reason. There's, there's a reason for tongues. It's, this is not just some goofy, you know, thing that 
God decided, whoop de doo let's do tongues. No. What does the word of God say about the tongue? The word of God says the tongue is the most unruly member of the body. It is the hardest member to tame and to bring under control. Oh. So if we can get ourselves to a place where we submit ourselves and yield ourselves to God to the extent that he is able to quicken our spirit and cause our spirit then to have control of our tongue, that's a pretty powerful thing because the tongue is a hard thing to tame. It's a hard thing to get under control. How did God separate the world? How did God create division in the world? At the Tower of Babel, when all the nations, as it were, were one, and, and all the people were one, and they all spoke the same language, and they could basically uh, put their mind to, to do whatever they wanted to do, and there was no obstacle uh, to them communicating with one another. So therefore, you could literally unite the world in effect, or the known world, to a singular cause. And this is what the Tower of Babel was all about. Everyone was in agreement, and they had all agreed, and they all were working on this singular project. And uh, what, did, what did the Word of God say? It, it said God caused the people to suddenly begin to speak in a variety of different languages. And that created conflict, it created confusion, it, it created division, because if you can't communicate with somebody, you don't, <laughs> I used to date, years ago I dated people who were Hispanic. Nothing on this planet made me more aggravated than going out with somebody and they'd have friends and stuff, and all they did the whole time was talk Spanish. That drove me nuts. Say, well, why did that bother you? That shouldn't have bothered you. They're Spanish. Yeah, but they knew good and bloody well I didn't speak Spanish and understand Spanish. So therefore, it was kind of rude and obnoxious for everybody around me to speak Spanish and me just sitting there like some kind of a dope hearing bobbity 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 and not having a clue what was going on or what was being said. And so when there's differences in language, then people gravitate toward those whom they can communicate with, those whom they can understand and those who can understand them. Am I right? If you go to a party and there are people there from many different nations and they all speak different languages, don't tell me you're going to stand there and talk to the German guy or you're going to stand there and talk to the Russian guy or you're going to stand there and talk to the Chinese guy. No, you're not because you can't talk. You don't know what he's saying. He doesn't know what you're saying. Obviously, you're going to find someone who speaks English and you're going to kind of stick with them because at least that person you can communicate with. So God was able to divide the people so that the entire world, as it were, could not unite in one singular common cause. And he did so by confounding the languages. Now, when we're born again, born of the water, baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sin, born of the Spirit, Holy Ghost baptism, when we're born again, we all now have a common experience that involves language that no longer separates but now it becomes that which binds us. It becomes, we've all had that. Remember I told you in, in the uh, book of Acts, we read about the Jews who had gone with 
uh, Peter to the house of Cornelius and they saw the Holy Ghost fall on the house of Cornelius and they all began to speak with other tongues and they said, oh, hey, you know, look what God, and, and they were shocked, they were baffled because on Gentiles, on non-Jews, the same identical experience they had had at Pentecost was now being experienced by these Gentiles. But what do you think that did? What do you think? Now, wait a minute. They're talking in tongues when they get the Holy Ghost the same way we spoke in tongues when we get the Holy Ghost. So all of a sudden, that becomes a common experience. So now, that's why we Pentecostal folk, when we get around other tongue-talking, Holy Ghost-filled people, you know, we have that common experience. We all share in that common experience, okay? It becomes something that unites the church. This is why Jesus said in Mark, the end of Mark, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Second thing on the list, they shall speak with new tongues. That's what Jesus said in the book of Mark, okay? It becomes the common denominator for the church, okay? And so, therefore, if the common denominator that identifies believers is the experience of speaking with other tongues, then when the Holy Ghost comes, that experience at that moment becomes the physical evidence. Do you follow what I'm saying? So now the church knows. You know. Okay? And uh, you know, I know, everybody around you knows that you got the Holy Ghost. Now, most people, when they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, whatever language God, uh, in essence, um, allows your spirit to pray and, and to uh, speak with, because it's your spirit that's praying. It is not, it's not a matter of God's spirit coming in you and speaking through you in another language. No, no, that's not what's happening. The Bible said in second chapter of the book of Acts, and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance, simply meaning as God enabled them to do so. That's all it means. So what God has done is he, by reason of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, he enables believers to speak in another language. And why is that? Well, it's simple. Because, listen, this is another wonderful uh, analogy. God, it, the Lord uses all these beautiful analogies, you know. When he had his conversation with Nicodemus late in the night, and Nicodemus comes to him in the garden and asks him, you know, talks to him. And uh, the Lord said, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, you know, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And the Lord answered and said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Now, a lot of people, I grew up in a church where they tried to say what the Lord was saying. Unless you're born of water, which is the physical birth, and born of the spirit, which is the spiritual birth. No, 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 no. It's not what Jesus said. He said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the new birth is a two-part experience. Well, guess what? So is the old birth. The born again experience is modeled after the first birth experience. When a baby is born, the first thing that transpires is he is, the, the term baptized literally means to bring forth from, to take out of the water. 
When a baby is born, where are they? They're in a water sack in mommy's belly. The water sack breaks, the water breaks, and the child comes forth from that. So they have to emerge, as it were, from the water. Okay, is that baby born because it's emerged from the water? No, because babies are born every day, still born. When do we know that baby is well? When do we know that baby's alive? When we hear something. You gotta hear something. You've gotta hear evidence that the lungs are working, that the child can breathe. And you hear what I'm telling you? The same thing is true of the born again experience. You're born of water, baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sin. You're born of the Spirit. Now you experience that new birth crying out like a baby. You, vo you vocalize, and aha, everybody knows the baby is well. The baby has the ability to breathe, and the baby has air, okay? And so there, there's this dual uh, representation in natural birth and spiritual rebirth, okay? Now, when most people receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, your spirit now, when you allow your spirit, meaning simply, it's, I wish, you know, the Bible said that the carnal man cannot understand or cannot receive spiritual things. And I know sometimes it's hard for people to understand spiritual principles, but I hope I can articulate it to you so that you can wrap your mind around it. When you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, God literally brings your spiritual man to life. We were prior to this, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Were we physically dead? No. Were we spiritually dead? Yes. When we're born again and our spirit is made alive within us, the evidence of that is we speak in a language that is not known to us cognitively. We are not familiar with the language uh, in any way on our own physically uh, you know, we have no knowledge of the language, but our spiritual man, deep down inside us, our spiritual man, now, every time your spiritual man speaks, rather than you speaking naturally from your head or from your heart, but when your spiritual man speaks, it will always speak in another language. It's going to speak in that other language. And as believers, when we receive the Holy Ghost, you learn to simply uh, get into a mind of prayer, get into a, a, a state of prayer or a state of worship, and you learn to allow your spiritual man to express, and you allow your spiritual man to pray and your spiritual man to worship. You allow your worship, your prayer, your praise to come not from just your head, not just from your lips, not just from your heart, but literally you allow it to emerge from your spirit man. And that is why you hear people uh, in worship, you know, uh, speaking with other tongues. That's why you hear people as they pray, speaking in other tongues or praying even, uh, excuse me, singing even in other tongues. Now, most people are going to speak in whatever language their spiritual man speaks in, uh, basically for the rest of their journey for the rest of their life. Their spiritual man, if God has enabled your spiritual man to speak, let's say, Mandarin, then you will speak Mandarin. Whenever you speak in other tongues, you'll be speaking in Mandarin uh, or Chinese or Japanese or whatever language, okay? However, 
there is a gift of the Spirit. There's a special thing that God does for some where their spiritual man, rather than simply speaking in one singular language unknown to the, to the person, you know, they speak in a variety of languages. And you say, well, that's dumb. What, what good purpose could be served? And well, you know, I mean, honestly, uh, it's, it, it, there's a certain amount of conjecture involved in trying to understand, you know, why God allows certain people um, the gift of diversity of tongues so that they speak in a variety of languages. Uh, sometimes this can be uh, a sign to people that this gift, the gift of tongues in general, is legitimate and is real. Uh, I was in a relationship for two years with somebody when I first started our work in New York City. And uh, this person, I, I used to call my Aunt Dorothy down in Texas and pray with her over the phone if I had a special need or something really pressing that I needed prayer about. She was my go-to. I used to love to call Aunt Dorothy and pray with her. Aunt Dorothy knew how to pray, I'll tell you. And I appreciate somebody who knows how to pray. She prayed with passion. She prayed sincerely. And she would pray and intercede in a very real way. And this one day, uh, Patrick was on the sofa, and I said, I'm going to call my aunt. I said, I need to pray with her about something. And I called her, and we were talking, and we got to praying. Well, in the process of praying, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord touched us. And I guess God was letting us know that what we were praying about, he was going to act on, and he was going to do something. And all of a sudden, boy, she and I got to praying in the Spirit. I mean, and over the phone, you know. She's praying in the Holy Ghost and shouting over there in Texas. I'm in New York City, and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost and shouting up here in New York. And uh, I we prayed for a good long while, and I was just off in the Spirit. Boy, I mean, I knew it was wonderful. When I got done with that call, Patrick said to me, he said, now mind you, th this was a guy, he was Jamaican, and he had been raised, I can't remember what uh, kind of religious background he had off the top of my head, but it was not spirit-filled. And he said to me, he said, Do you know, while you were praying on the phone with her and you started speaking in another language I said yeah he said there was a point where literally it was so obvious it wasn't even funny he said there was a point when it was like somebody flipped a switch and you went from speaking one language to speaking an entirely different language he said you could hear it just listening to you, he said, I literally heard it. He said, you were, uh, all at once you were speaking this one way, and then all of a sudden you were speaking this whole different language. What do you think that did for Patrick? Do you think that helped him to understand this as a legitimate experience, as something real? Yes, it did. Do you follow what I'm saying? So diversity of tongues can be, uh, partly, it can be something the Lord uses as a way of demonstrating uh, the reality of this experience and the reality of this gift. Also, the Lord may use that then um, when he is wanting to use tongues and interpretation, especially, and I'm going to get to the interpretation shortly, as a divine sign to a specific individual. I'll give you an example. When I was a kid growing up in the Pentecostal church in southern New England that I grew up in, when I was about eight, we had built a new church building, 
and we were going to move into our new church building and they were going to do a big ribbon cutting ceremony and all this you know and so we had this big outdoor service uh, in front of the building before they cut the ribbon and everybody went inside and uh, brother barlow was our pastor and brother barlow was standing up on the stairs you know and he's preaching and talking and then all of a sudden somebody in the congregation began to offer a message in tongues they began to speak with another language and the church recognizes when this isn't somebody praying this isn't somebody worshiping the lord you know just between them and god this is something that we need to become silent and, and listen and then following the message will come the interpretation and so this person spoke a message in tongues and then brother barlow interpreted it well he shared this story like the next sunday or two later and he said a lady from the community who had come for a ribbon cutting wasn't a member of our church didn't know anything about our church came up to me the week of our ribbon cutting ceremony and asked me where did you study hebrew and brother barlow said i've never studied hebrew why do you ask she said, well, surely you've studied Hebrew. He said, no, ma'am, I haven't. She said, well, that man spoke in Hebrew. And then you interpreted word for word exactly what he said in English. See, he had the gift of interpretation of tongues. The other person had the gift of diversity of tongues because that person I can tell you, I knew, I, I, to this day, I know who that person is. And when that person would speak in tongues, uh, generally speaking, and offer a message, it, it didn't sound at all Hebrew to me, but that one Sunday it did, okay? And she said, well, you interpreted word for word what that man says. She said, I'm Jewish. <laughs> now, do you think that was not a sign? Do you think that was not a supernatural evidence to this lady? She heard one person who doesn't know Hebrew offer a message in Hebrew. She then heard the pastor who doesn't know Hebrew interpret the Hebrew. Okay? So the diversity of tongues, uh, this is something the Lord can use, like I say, when he's wanting to... Um, manifest in a special way to a specific individual for the benefit of a specific individual my great grandmother or excuse me my great aunt betty uh, up in connecticut she and my great uncle met during world war ii she was um, from the germany area and they had met during world war ii not in germany it was outside of germany somewhere and um fell in love you know and they decided they were going to get married and all that she came to the united states and uh at one point she began to attend a baptist church well my grandmother and my great grandmother my mother's mother and, and grandmother had uh, come to the lord and originally they started in a baptist church but then uh, somehow or another, they, they wound up going into a Pentecostal church. Long story short, both my grandmother and my great-grandmother, born and raised Roman Catholic, received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and they were in the Pentecostal church. So they used to invite Aunt Betty to church, and Aunt Betty would go with them. And Aunt Betty said, she said, oh, I used to love the worship. I used to love those people were so sincere and they loved Jesus. Oh my goodness, they loved Jesus so much. She said, and everything. But you know, the talking in tongues and all that and shouting. And she said, I, I wasn't so sure about that. She said, I would go back to my pastor and I would ask him about it. And
and she said, and my pastor would let me know, that's not for today. That's of the devil. That's this, that's that. Blah, 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 blah. So she said, I never quite believed him because the people, if it was of the devil, she said, my God, why would these people love the Lord so much if it was of the devil? That didn't make any sense. Anything that, that the devil does is going to distract you from loving and living for God, honey. Think about it. Anything the devil, they, the devil ain't going to do nothing in the world that's going to help you love the Lord more and help you be more passionate about living for God. That doesn't make any sense. So anyway, she said, finally, you know, she kept going and visiting the Pentecostal church. And then after a while, and I believe it was Brother Tetlock's church, after a while, she said, one day I decided to ask God, Lord, if this, if this Holy Ghost is real, if this baptism of the Holy Ghost is real, and she shared this with me herself, that I, I haven't heard this testimony secondhand, I heard it with my own ears. She said, then let somebody speak in tongues in German so I can understand them in German. And she said, I no sooner said that, she said there was a lady in the church who was Italian. And she said this Italian lady spoke English with a very broken accent because she had a very heavy Italian accent. She said all of a sudden this lady jumped up and just started speaking and worshiping God in perfect German. My aunt said, and my aunt Betty said, and she literally, as she was telling me the story, she said it in German. She said, this is what she began to say, blah, 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 you know. And she said, and Aunt Betty got tears streaming down her face, and she was in her 90s when she told me this. I had heard her testimony, but I, she told me herself in her 90s. And she said, oh, Chuck, she said, right then I knew this was real. She said, this woman couldn't even speak English. And all of a sudden, uh, at least plainly because of her accent, all of a sudden she said she was speaking perfect German. Perfect German. And Aunt Betty received the Holy Ghost. And she's been in the Jesus name Pentecostal Apostolic Church ever since. And she says, oh, I know it's real. She said, I ask God if this is real, let me hear somebody. She said, I never dreamed it would be this particular lady because that just further emphasized how real it was, you know. And so anyway, um, apparently this lady had the gift of diversity of tongues. Do you follow what I'm saying? So when the Lord wants to be able to express something to, for someone's benefit in a specific language, rather than you're being locked into one particular language, he can allow you to speak another language. Or as these people that have diversity of tongues, when they pray, um, they uh, today they may be praying in Japanese tomorrow they may be praying in German and um, I, I can speak from personal experience um, I've actually I've actually had it happen especially when I would travel to Oklahoma Tommy and I were living in Dallas and I'd be traveling up to Oklahoma to uh, go to our property up there and kind of have some quiet time. I used to love the trip to Oklahoma because uh, uh, when I was going by myself and I didn't have booby with me, because when he's with me, I kind of feel obligated to try to talk to him, you know, because me, I'm a talker. And, uh, but when I'm alone, I pray and I worship and I sing. And, well, even when he and I are together, I sing most of the time, but anyway, and I listen to worship music and stuff, but anyhow, but when I would be traveling to Oklahoma, on several occasions as I'm driving, I would get in the spirit, and I begin to pray and worship in the spirit, and I swear, I, 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 I just know 
that what was coming out of me was Native American. I, just, I, I can't even explain it. I, I just know that it was. And I thought, Lord, you know, it's funny because Oklahoma is famous for being Native American territory, you know. And it's almost like the Lord says, uh, while you're worshiping me coming up through here, I'm going to have you worship me in the language of the people that once occupied this land, you know, once lived here. And, uh, and honestly, it, there was, there was something, I, I, there was something beautiful about it. There was something melodic about it, you know, and, uh, but anyway, so over the years, there's been any number of occasions when, um, matter of fact, there was one Sunday, uh, you and I talked about it. There was one Sunday I was looking on video. I'm trying, this is way back. This is quite a ways back. And I had kind of gotten happy and spoken in tongues a little bit while I was preaching as I'm inclined to do on occasion. And I said to Tommy, I said, after I watched it on video, I said, look at this, check this out. Each time, three different times in the same message, the same service. And you could tell that each time it was a different language. Each time it had a very distinct and different sound. Now that's not to say that the majority of the time I, the Lord, you know, I don't speak in a, in a particular language, but it's just to say that when you have the gift of diversity of tongues, you can pray and you can worship the Lord in a variety of different languages. The Lord, again, may use that as a sign to someone who speaks in a particular language and um, or he may use the diversity of the tongues in and of itself to kind of demonstrate how real this experience is to people. And so, um, so you know, there's, there's the gift of diversity of tongues. Now, lastly, we have the gift of interpretation of tongues. Well, here's the interesting thing. When we speak with other tongues, and we're going to be going into a lot more detail on all of this, okay? I told you, right now, we're just trying to kind of give a, an overview of the nine gifts. Then some of the gifts we're going to go into much, much greater, like prophecy. We're going to go into a lot, lot of detail on prophecy. Um, tongues and tongues and interpretation, we're actually going to be going into much more detail because there's other places in Scripture where these things are spoken about and uh, where the Apostle Paul gives specific instruction concerning the operation of tongues during worship and what have you, and tongues with interpretation and prophecy. So we'll be discussing this more at a later date as well in greater detail. But the, the, the basic that you need to understand is when we speak with other tongues, it is an unknown tongue, meaning simply we have no cognitive knowledge of that language. We uh, there are people who can speak 10 different languages because they've studied 10 different languages. They receive the Holy Ghost, and guess what happens? They speak a language they don't know, okay? So it's always a language you do not know that uh, your spirit is allowed to express itself in. But then interpretation of tongues, there are times when God communicates to the church. There's two ways the Lord communicates uh, to the church in a corporate setting. One is prophecy. The other is tongues with interpretation. Okay? Because when a person speaks in an unknown tongue, now, now there might be somebody there that understands that particular language, like the day that Hebrew, the, the Jewish lady, okay? But the rest of the church didn't understand it, obviously. So uh, 
there's specific protocol set forth in the writing of the apostles, and we're going to get into it in more detail. But when a message is uttered in an unknown language in a corporate environment, there is always supposed to be an interpretation. In other words, uh, now I'm not saying if somebody's worshiping the Lord or praying and they, you know, rap, tap, 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 uh, that it has to be interpreted. That is not, but the Apostle Paul said, I'll, uh, he said, uh, I'll pray in the Spirit, he said, and I'll pray with my understanding. He said, I'll sing in the Spirit and I'll sing with my understanding. So in other words, there's nothing wrong with speaking in tongues or praying in tongues or singing in tongues in the course of prayer or worship. There's nothing wrong with that. Baptist folks love to confuse scripture and twist it because after all, they don't believe in this, but if they did believe in it, then they're doing it wrong anyway because you're not supposed to do it unless it's interpreted. No, that's asinine. The Apostle Paul made it abundantly clear. I'll pray in the Spirit. I'll pray with my understanding. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with my understanding. He made it abundantly clear what Paul did say, basically, and again, we're going to get into this in a lot more detail, <clears throat> but what Paul said was uh, the Corinthian church had gotten into the mindset that the more you talked in tongues, the more spiritual you were. They, they you know, were, they just got this mindset in their head that the more somebody talked in tongues, boy, the more spiritual they were. So you wound up going to church and people would be praying in the spirit and worshiping in the spirit the entire service. And everybody in the church is competing with one another. They're all doing the same thing. They're all, and it's all about just yielding yourself and, and allowing your spirit. So it's not like these people are putting on anything. No, they were sincerely worshiping in the spirit. They were sincerely praying in the spirit. But Paul said the only problem with it is, he said, you look like a bunch of nuts because if somebody comes in off the street into your meeting and y'all are doing this, he said, that person's saying, okay, what in the world's going on here? It's like me in the car with everybody speaking Spanish. I don't understand a thing in the world that's going on. And Paul said, so what could have you done? You know, what value have you offered anyone aside from yourself to be doing this. He said, no. He said, you know, when you come into a corporate worship environment, uh, it, it should always be a mixture. There should always be your own language and allowing the spirit at the same time. And uh, if you look back at the history of the Roman Catholic Church for many, 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 many years, their mass was conducted in Latin. Well, that's stupid because nobody understood one word that was being said unless you were Spanish or, you know, Hispanic and understood Latin at some level. Um, and then finally they began to change the rules and they made it where mass could be uh, performed in the language the people spoke, okay? Well, this that's what Paul was talking about. You know, he said, what good if the whole service is... I used to know a preacher in the Church of God. He used to drive me up the wall. He used to drive me crazy. Um, every time he preached, I swear he just thought it made it, I don't know whether he thought it made him look spiritual or what, but every other line, he'd be a rap tap tap in tongues. And the Lord said, that he was going to go and, and, and I mean it drove me utterly nuts it, it was just stupid it was stupid there was no there was no rhyme or reason there was no logic to it there was you know it didn't serve any purpose the way he did things okay and it's like my god you can't preach a message and convey what god's placed in you to to tell the church, there are times when I'm trying to preach something, and the the truth, the 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 nugget that I'm trying to articulate, gets down in my spirit and makes me so happy I want to just scream, 
and I may bump it up, bump it up, bump it up a little bit. You know what I'm saying? That's my spirit literally just kind of expressing my utter delight with what I'm what I've got in my hand, okay? Literally, when, when somebody does that, that's what it is. You know, their spirit is rejoicing and their spirit is celebrating something that, <laughs> either something they just said or something they're about to say or something they got in their head and it just, to them, is so exciting and so wonderful that all of a sudden their spirit man just wells up, you know, inside you just get so bubbly that you just got to let out a little glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God in Japanese. <laughs> and that, you know, that is one of the things too. Uh, I've heard people be critical because when somebody speaks in tongues, she always says the same phrase. Yeah, we used to tease about Dorothy because years ago when I was a kid, one of the uh, phrases that she used to say, uh, it was funny because we always said it sounded like she's talking about a stolen car because one of the things she said is a hot Toyota. And so, so we tease her about our hot Toyotas, you know, but Think about it. When you're worshiping, most of the time you worship kind of using the same phrases you always use. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, guess what? Your spirit, through the spirit, you're doing the same identical thing. The only difference is instead of it coming from your mind and your head, it's coming from your spirit. And, but you may be saying a similar phrase or the same phrase, you know, over and over again in another language uh, that doesn't delegitimize it because it's the same. And that doesn't mean to say that they just so-called learned or uh, through repetition, they've kind of gotten that phrase down, you know. But, you know, because Dorothy would also give a message in tongues, and it was completely much more expanded than that phrase. Do you know what I'm saying? So, um, so you know, so there's, so uh, you can understand then why sometimes when people, you know, even when I'm preaching, perhaps there may be times. When I, I get happy and I say something, and you might say, well, that sounds very similar to the way I've heard him say it before. Well, of course, I may be saying the same identical thing I said before. And what would be unusual about that? While I'm preaching, I say, praise God all the time. While I'm preaching, I say, oh, glory, all the time. While I'm preaching, I say, thank you, Jesus, all the time. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, there's there's... There's no, you know, um, that, that, that there's no problem with that either. Um, but when a message is offered in the church, there's a reason for tongues with interpretation. And I'm kind of jumping ahead of ourselves tonight a little bit. We're going to get into it in more detail. Um, prophecy serves a specific function. Tongues with interpretation serves a different function function. The Apostle Paul says, and we'll get into it later, but I'll, I'll kind of give you a precursor tonight. Prophecy is for the hearing and the benefit of the church, believers. Tongues with interpretation, listen to this, is for the benefit of unbelievers. It's always a sign to the unbeliever. And this is why when there's a message with tongues and inter interpretation, it generally has a very different um, content than a prophetic word. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. Growing up as a kid, I remember there'd be a message with the tongues and interpretation and the interpretation would always be, um, for instance, you know, maybe the Lord would say, 
uh, I've brought you to this place tonight. You're not here by accident. I brought you here so you might know that I love you and I care about you and I want you to be saved. Do you follow what I'm saying? Obviously, that is a message that's kind of geared to the unbeliever, okay? And um, so tongues with interpretation, and you say, well, why in the world would God do that that way? Well, tongues in that instance, a message in another language simply becomes the sounding of a bell that grabs your attention. When the whole church goes silent and somebody's going bah, 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 in another language, you're obviously you're listening. You're like, okay, what's that? Well, now the church stays silent when there's a message with the tongues until the interpretation is offered. So now you hear a message in tongues, and you're an unbeliever. You've never been in a Pentecostal church a day in your life. You walk in, somebody, bah, 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 and you're sitting there, and you're thinking, okay. Everybody's sitting there quiet. Nobody says a word. Then all of a sudden, the interpretation comes. You see what I'm saying? It, it's it's, it's the, the Lord uses that message in tongues to still the congregation and to get the unbeliever's attention is what he does. And then the interpretation is geared toward the unbeliever. There are a lot of times I've seen, I've heard it taught in charismatic circles, and it's wrong that prophecy and tongues with interpretation basically are the same thing. No, they are not. No, they are not. No, they are not. No, they are not. The Apostle Paul made it clear that they serve two different functions. Why, when it comes to prophecy, why is tongues, excuse me, yeah, why is a message in tongues not necessary before a prophetic word? How can someone in a congregation simply begin to speak a prophetic word? And when they do, listen, when they do, again, the church, spirit-filled people recognize a prophetic message when it is, um, uh, trying to think of the word I want to use here, when it, you know, it's just uttered. during the course of a service. It can be during the worship. It can be during the preaching. And when a prophetic word is suddenly offered, the church does the same identical thing it does with a message in tongues. Go silent. Everybody goes silent. Why? Well, because prophecy doesn't require the message in tongues because God's people, what did Jesus say? Know my voice. He said, my sheep know my voice. Now, somebody could come into church that's crazy or drunk or stupid and start screaming and hollering, and you're not going to get that same reverent, reverent quiet that falls over the congregation so they can hear what this nut or this drunk or this person has to say. But when the Spirit of the Lord quickens a prophetic word and you begin, someone begins to speak a prophetic word, and oftentimes the Lord will do that to, um, uh, uh, sometimes he'll do it like during a message, a, a sermon or after a sermon, to confirm what's been preached or what's being said, you know, um, or to offer an additional insight or an additional twist on what's being said. Maybe, maybe there was something he wanted the preacher to say that the preacher didn't say. So he'll quicken somebody that has the gift of prophecy to begin to utter this message. 
and it comes uh, tongues with interpretation and prophecy both they come with this kind of a inward um, prodding I guess that's the best word I can use um, the Holy Ghost will begin to kind of urge that individual you need to speak you 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 need to you need to do this and um, and it, like I say if it's a message with tongues then their their spirit is just like I it's hard to explain but it's like your spiritual man is just almost chomping at the bit to speak and the reason for that is because the Spirit of the Lord has quickened something in your spiritual man to speak. And so, um, now, are you without control? No, you're not. And again, we're going to get into all this in a little while. But the, the Apostle Paul said, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, someone can feel a great urge to offer a message in tongues and yet not do it. They, they can kind of fight it off and, and, you know, they can kind of hold back on it and not let, let not yield to the leading of the Holy Ghost and offer it. Same thing with a prophetic word. They cannot yield to the Spirit and offer that prophetic word, okay? Because you always have control. The, the Holy Ghost does not take over your body and make something happen, you know, without your uh, being in control. But again, the gifts operate according to God's placing them with certain people. And he gives them to people who are going to be obedient and allow the Lord to use them in those areas. So someone who offers a message in tongues is generally somebody the Lord knows. If I quicken a message in them uh, in uh, an unknown tongue, they're going to obey, they're going to yield, and they're going to offer it because they know, they've learned to recognize when this isn't me. This isn't the Lord's trying to say something. He wants to express something. Same thing with prophecy. You know it's not, this is not me. The Lord's trying to say something. And the funny thing about prophecy is, at least for me, I don't know about everybody, uh, but a lot of times, the Lord, when he quickens a prophetic, and I mean a spontaneous, that's the word I was looking for earlier, a spontaneous message in tongues, or a spontaneous prophecy. When the Lord inspires like a spontaneous prophecy in me, um, I literally will get like a sentence. And I will feel this, I'll feel the Spirit of the Lord just pushing, almost, <laughs> almost like somebody trying to push you out a door, you know. I'll literally feel the Spirit of the Lord kind of pushing me, say this. And it may be something as simple as, I am the Lord, that is my name. That may be all he gives me. And what happens is, when I begin to speak that, Boom, it literally just becomes a faucet. And after that, every word that comes, it's in English. It can be understood by everybody in the room. But every word that comes after that is literally spontaneously given me as I'm speaking. That's how prophecy generally is, um, uh, for me, is in terms of a spontaneous prophecy. Like I said, there are times when the Lord gives you um He'll cause you to speak something that is prophetic, but speaking something that is prophetic versus speaking forth a message, a prophetic message is just slightly different in their manifestation, okay? All right, so I'm going to get into a lot more detail. Uh, we will be talking about tongues with interpretation. I'm going to show you the scriptures that deal with um, the... the uh, the use of tongues and the use of tongues and interpretation and prophecy and corporate worship. The Apostle Paul had to, in writing to the church at Corinth, he had to offer them some uh, teaching on how 
to properly operate in the spirit because like I said, they kind of have gotten into this mindset that, boy, this is so wonderful. You know, praying in the spirit is so wonderful. When I come to church, I just thought of praying in the spirit from the minute I get there till the minute I leave. And Paul said, no, because how does the guy next to you understand what you're saying? And you say, well, why do I care what the guy next to me, you know, understands or not? Because like I've taught in our church, like I try to help people understand Corporate worship is all about piggybacking off of one another. That's part of the whole purpose of corporate worship and corporate prayer for that matter. There are times, you know, you go to a church prayer meeting and you don't hardly know how to pray. Maybe you're a new believer. Maybe you just don't know how to pray. And somebody there does, and they're praying, and you find yourself kind of almost eavesdropping on their communication with the Lord, so to speak. But what you do is you keep offering agreement. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Bless sister. Yes, Lord. Help her. She's sick, Lord. Heal her body, God, in Jesus' name. And you see, what you're doing is you're actually... We're all members of one body. You're, you're not invading anything. No, because we're piggybacking off of one another. And this is true in worship. This is true in prayer. This is why I say people tend to look at church attendance as, well, what do I get out of it? Rather than what do you bring to it? Because if you come to church and you know how to worship, you know how to worship the Lord. You raise your hands. You say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. You know, um, you offer the Lord the fruit of your lips, which simply means you offer verbal uh, adoration and praise. You know, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, glory to God. Um, you know, those sorts of phrases and those sorts of things. And um, what happens is people around you, are able to piggyback off of you. They learn from you. They're, they're able to imitate you, so to speak. And they're not imitating you to make fun of you. They're, they're wanting to worship the Lord too, but they don't know how. But watching you, they then are able to say, oh, okay, I can raise my hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? And so... Um, this is why Paul said you don't just come into the church and everything is in the spirit. Everything is in an unknown tongue. So because if you do that, then nobody around you can benefit. Nobody around you can piggyback on your praise. Nobody around you can piggyback on your prayer. And so you're not, you know, you're not benefiting anybody but yourself. And so you don't want to do that because worship, corporate worship and corporate prayer is all about being able to, I, always, I call it piggyback, you know, piggyback. And um, so we'll be going into a lot more detail. Um, as I've said before, the, uh, the, the more pronounced gifts, I guess you might say, which are prophecy, uh, tongues with interpretation. Um, those two in particular, we will be doing a lot more uh, articulation on those gifts, okay? In, in the next few weeks, we'll be talking a lot more about those. Uh, next week, there are some scriptures we're going to look at that deal with just the gifts in general. And again, that has to do with the operation and the uh, administration of the gifts, you know, why they're there, who God gives them to, so on and so forth. And uh, but we'll be going into much greater detail by the time we're done with this study, which may honestly take two or three months, for all I know. I'm, I'm not sure how long it'll take. You should, folks, you should have an abundantly clear understanding of what the gifts are, how they operate, why they operate, um, how to properly um, 
operate within these various gifts, so on and so forth. And uh, it's exciting to me. I've had, I'm going to close with this today. Um, a lady, and I believe it was the preacher's wife, the pastor who baptized me in Jesus' name many years ago, um, his wife, God help me, she's a very critical negative woman to be honest I'm just going to say it because I um, it's one thing about her I didn't like way back in the day she didn't think anything of voicing her opinion about anything and, and really didn't care how it came across or how it sounded and could sometimes be kind of offensive and hurtful okay and uh, well they happen to get wind about my ministry and what we're doing now. And many years ago, this, this, this is going back probably, good Lord, 12, 15 years ago now, in that we were in Dallas. And I got a message from her and uh, an email, I think it was, and she literally said to me, how in the world can you be who you are? And and yet, the gifts of the Spirit are operating in you and through you. Well, she just admitted something. She just admitted that she obviously recognized the gifts as the gifts. So she didn't say to me, you're faking it. You know, that isn't real. But remember, that's not what she said. She said, how can you be who you are? And yet the gifts of the Spirit are operating in you, okay? So she had watched our videos online and heard our messages. She had heard occasions when we had tongues with them because we, we have tongues with interpretation. We have prophecy. We have these things happening in the church. Um, there's no particular frequency. Um, I under no circumstances I'm interested in ever trying to make something happen. So therefore, these things are always to be um, according to the manifestation of God's Spirit. In other words, God's the one who determines when there's message with tongues and interpretation, when there's a prophetic utterance. And uh, under no circumstances are we ever to try to uh, generate or manipulate or, you know, make something happen. So anyway, um, but she recognized, you know, the gifts of the Spirit were in operation. Uh, we've had people healed in our ministry over the years, you know. Um, uh, I mean, they're, they're, you know, the, the, the <laughs> many of the gifts have been manifested over the years, you know. And uh, so we are what I would refer to as a science-following church. You can believe that. And we are a church where the gifts of the Spirit Manifest, and I'm going to tell you why we're a church where the gifts of the Spirit manifest. Because we're a church where the gifts of the Spirit are welcome. You know, uh, there's a reason why I pray at the beginning of the service. You know, Lord, we just lose your presence. We lose your power in this place. Because we want the Spirit of the Lord to manifest. We want God to do whatever the Lord wants to do. And uh, like Brother Gillum used to say to me years ago, he said, Chuck, there ain't nothing you can do. God can't do better. He said, if the Spirit of the Lord starts to move in a worship service and you don't wind up preaching, then it, fine, so be it. Because apparently the Lord wanted to do something for the people that you couldn't have, that your preaching couldn't have done for them, you know. And there are times when God ministers to the church all by himself, by the Holy Ghost, and there is no preaching. You know, you wind up having an altar service, you wind up having a prayer line, you know, uh, whatever the case might be, you know, uh, you wind up with a spontaneous prayer meeting breaking out, um, you have a time of intercession and prayer. Uh, whatever God wants to do, we are always open to. 
And so anyway, I hope this is a blessing to you. Uh, I encourage you to please share your thoughts if um, this Bible study is indeed a blessing to you. Let us know. Uh, it's encouragement for us. Uh, this is a tough work, as I've said before. Uh, the work that we do, folks, is not an easy work. So um, all the encouragement this old preacher can get, I appreciate, believe me. And at the same time, if you share thoughts publicly on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, then those thoughts um, are available for others to read. And in the process of reading other people's comments, that may encourage them to listen to our Bible study. That may encourage them to listen to the sermon. You know, they might otherwise just pass it by. But when they happen to see, I've actually had that happen myself when I was, I'd be on uh, YouTube, you know, and I'd, I'd see a, a video and I'd kind of click on it and I wasn't sure if I really wanted to look at it or not. But then I'd see all these comments on the side and I'd kind of look down the comments and that would then turn me on to watching the video. And I'd say, yeah, you know, maybe I'll check this out, you know. And so we really need people to help us with that. There are a lot of people in our community who are very gun shy and nervous and afraid of anything with church or Christian on the front of it. And if they see you commenting and seeing um, positive things about our messages, about our church, about our ministry, about our teaching, whatever the case might be, you may be instrumental in encouraging them to check it out. I want to tell you real quick, um, yesterday I had to go to Home Depot here and um, in the process of my doing what I had to do at the customer service desk yesterday, uh, the young lady that waited on me had a, a rainbow pin on her thing and I kind of tapped it and I said, I like that. And she said, thank you, I do too. I said, well, I'm part of the rainbow family. She said, I am too. So I got to talk to her about the church and she was excited. Um, she has a partner. They've been together for a few years. They want to get married in September. I said, do you have anybody to do the wedding? She said, no, not yet. I said, well, I do. She said, did you do them? I said, yes. She said, oh, great. You know, would you be interested? I said, sure, I'll be interested. Then, uh, after doing business with her and talking to her and giving her a card for the church, I, I had a manager had to come and help me and this lady manager was helping me and at one point she said well I see here you're a preacher she said Where, where's your church and she said if, if you knew me she said you'd understand why my friends would be shocked that I'm even asking you where your church is she said because I'm not a religious person and all that um, she said but I have a reason for asking and so I began to tell her about our church and everything. And she said, that actually really excites me. She said, I have a daughter who is uh, gay. And she and her partner, she said, and she has been trying to find a church she could go to. And here in Alabama, she said, man, she's going to churches and actually had people walk up to her and tell her right to her, if you're going to hell for baby, you know. And she said, my poor daughter got so discouraged and so hurt by somebody doing that to her. She said, she's very religious. She's very committed to, you know, the mother's not, but the daughter is. And so I told her I'd give her her outreach cards. And, you know, I said, make sure your daughter, she said, oh, I will. She said, I, and at one point we were talking and the, the lady said to me, she said, honestly, I don't even know why. She said, but I am just covered in goosebumps right now. She said, I've just got goosebumps. And uh, so hopefully the Lord will help us break through in this community and reach some people. If we could just get some folks to start coming. And uh, that would be very helpful. And if you live in the area, you know, by all means, come out and be with us. Help us do what we're trying to do. If you know anybody in the area that plays uh, piano, organ, keyboards, 
a guitar, <laughs> I don't care, a trumpet. Uh, we need somebody to come help us with music, and we are willing to pay a little stipend. You know, it wouldn't be a huge amount of money, but it would be enough to more than compensate, at least for your gas and time, uh, to come out on Sunday for a couple hours every Sunday and help us with live music rather than uh, pre-recorded. I can't stand using pre-recorded. We run into copyright issues all the time, and that's a problem. We can't sing songs we'd like to sing because we don't have music for it, you know? And especially at the end of the service, you know when we close with a, a song at the end of the service, a lot of times I have a song in my head I'd love to sing, but we don't have music for it. Well, we can't do an a cappella one, because I like for us to sing it, and then I like to have the music played, you know, quietly in the background as we close the service out with prayer. So anyway, um, keep us in prayer. We are trying desperately to do a very difficult work in an extremely difficult location. Um, if I could have picked a location to start a work, um, I guarantee you this would have been probably about the last location on planet Earth that I would have picked um, because there's nothing here that helps you to do the kind of work that we're doing and uh, absolutely nothing. And so we need all the prayer support we can get. We've lost a couple of our tithers in recent weeks. Um, some people are without jobs right now, um, and we only started out with literally a handful, and we literally have lost the majority of them because now we have people who've lost their jobs, uh, people who, for whatever reason, felt that um, it was wise to redirect their tithe elsewhere. And, um, you know, um, so... We can use the support financially if you're able. Uh, we appreciate all the financial support we can get. You can go to our website, and in the top right-hand portion of the, the banner at the top of the website, there's a button for online donations, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you for the gifts of the Spirit, which help us. Lord, to communicate with you, to hear from you, to receive from you the blessing that we need, the direction that we need, the guidance, the instruction. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every sincere believer under the sound of my voice today. I ask God that you would quicken within them a the ability to appreciate and identify when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation. Help them, Lord, to appreciate when a word is being spoken that is prophetic or to understand and to uh, properly perceive when a prophetic message is being uttered, when a word uh, comes in tongues and interpretation. Help them, Lord, to appreciate that special, precious manifestation of your Spirit. Help them, Lord, to identify and be grateful and receive a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom when it comes. Master, in the name of Jesus, oh God, we need to do a work in this world Night is coming, it's coming fast when no man will be able to work. And the door will be closed, the bridegroom will have come, the door will be closed, and no one will be able to enter or exit. If we're going to do a work for you, we must do it now. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Lord, keep us in your care and keep us safe. We live in a violent nation and a violent world, and we need the protection that only our God can give. Master, today, in the name of Jesus, be with us, be with our extended members, our church family that lives beyond this city and beyond this community. 
Bless, Lord, and help those that are in need this hour. Be a blessing and a help to them. And Master, help us to be once again uh, in a place where we might join in our service Sunday or next Wednesday. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, folks, I appreciate your joining us tonight. And I welcome you to come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time for a celebration of life in Christ. And then next Wednesday for our midweek Bible study and continuation of our look at the gifts of the Spirit, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.